for coming. We appreciate you coming out tonight. It's um, this is a having a candidate forum on the school to prison pipeline is an important uh, thing for our community, and we appreciate the candidates coming out, and we appreciate the community coming out. My name is Professor Vanilla Randall. I should say emeritus. Um, and from, I'm a law professor at the University of Dayton, and I'm one of the co-founders of Racial Justice Now. I'm Maria Holtz. I'm also a co-founder for Racial Justice Now. I am a parent of a student in Dayton Public Schools. I have a son uh, that attends the all-boys school here in West Dayton. And so we're working on this issue together because we care about um, the statistics and the issues that are happening, particularly for young black children within the school system and black males in particular. Let me tell you a little bit about the process. I, what I tell, I got to get out of this jacket. I say to people, I wear the jacket until everybody sits down and see that I, in fact, wore a jacket. <laughs> but it's too hot, so I usually get out of it really quick. Um, Dignity in Schools is a national organization that has had, that has a national campaign, campaign it, for the last five years, I believe, on pushing children out. Uh, push outs and we have partnered with them we're the only organization in the state of Ohio parent organization there's one other organization that is partner but we're the only a parent organization that has partnered with them to do something what we've done is as sort of the thing that we're going to do tonight is a candidates forum and what we decided to do is to ask questions to use this as an opportunity to both educate ourselves and them and find out their position and to ask questions related to the school to prison pipeline. We in fact had a process that it, the questions just didn't blow, we didn't take them off a website somewhere. What we did is we sent out, we, for, for the last two and a half months, we've had a web page that people have been a part of and we have been kind of putting information up on that web page. And then we asked people who have been a participant of that web page to submit questions, which reminds me, could you cut off your phones, please? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, over the course, we've got about 50 questions. Yes. In total, both total. from the website and from people who email and from the weekly discussion group, the, the, not discussion group, but work group that worked on it, we got 50 questions. We obviously cannot ask 50 questions. We're going to ask three or four. And uh, the format is this. We will ask, the candidates have been informed of the format ahead of time. We will ask the same question of all the candidates. They will get two minutes to answer. The, a 30 sec when they're within 30 seconds of the end, the 30 second sign will go up. And when they're within, when at the end, they'll stop. I really plead for candidates to stop so that I don't have to get rude. Uh, uh, it's important, I think, to keep things moving, that everybody stays on time. So when you see the 30 second sign, that's the time to start pulling your thoughts in and wrapping it up. We will ask everyone the same question. The, in order, we randomize their names, and so the, the order is based on some random number generator that I used. For the first questions, we will start with first the mayor candidates and then the commissioner candidates. For all of the rest of the questions, it's just going to be random until the last question where we will end with the mayor candidates and then the commission candidates. But even those, well, it's not too much randomness you can get with two people, but uh, those are in random order. We have, we ask the candidates that for their first two minutes to introduce themselves, so we're not going to take the time to introduce them. They're going to introduce themselves and say whatever they want to say, but we ask them to make sure that they tie it in to the school to prison pipeline. So Maria, you want to start with the first question? Yes. 
So the first question, the school to prison pipeline, uh, there's a, first of all, I'm going to give a bit of background information and then we're going to ask the question and give a, some definitions. The school to prison pipeline is one of the most important human rights challenges facing our nation today. The school to prison pipeline specifically refers to a national trend of criminalizing rather than educating our nation's children. With only 5% of the world population in the United States has 25% of the world's prison population. Nearly 50% of all state prisoners are locked up for nonviolent crimes. Blacks, particularly young black males, make up the disproportionate share of the U.S. prison population. In 2008, young black men ages 30, 8, 18 to 34 were at least six times more likely to be incarcerated than young white men. <clears throat> the pipeline encompasses the growing use of zero tolerance dis discipline policies, school-based arrests, disciplinary alternative schools, and secure detention to marginalize the most at-risk youth and deny them the education that they deserve and need. The question is, what is your opinion about mass incarceration and how the school to prison pipeline contributes to it? And generally, what do you think needs to be done? What role can the city play? And the mayor of candidates and A.J. Wagner's first. Good evening. I'm A.J. Wagner. Um, by the way, how many minutes do we have at the opening? You have two, two minutes with okay. a 30 second warning. Okay, thank you. Um, I uh, used to be a teacher, I mean, I also used to be a judge, so I know a lot about the mass incarceration situation. I used to be a Montgomery County auditor, I've owned my own business, um, I still own my own business, I've managed businesses and I've cons been a consultant to a lot of businesses because uh, I'm an attorney. The school to prison pipeline, however, I've had a particularly good experience with in this sense. About 1990, uh, one or two, uh, Allen Classical Academy, which was over on Old North Dayton, began a program to deal with the school to prison pipeline in a sense. They didn't know that's what it was back then. But there was a school there, Allen Classical Academy, that was uh, suspending about 150 of their 550 kids, a total of about 750 times during the course of a year. They began a program called, um, called uh, Word of the Week. And they asked me to participate by writing poetry for kids that would go with the Word of the Week. Kindness, generosity, citizenship, sportsmanship, words like that, perseverance. And so I would write poems that would go with each of those, those words. And um, the teachers would uh, uh, introduce kids uh, and, and have kids uh, say the word if they said you know instead of saying here when they called their name they would say uh, generosity and, and, and so that they drilled the word into them they had bulletin boards etc anyway after five years of this program those kids those kids then experienced only ten suspensions total ten suspensions down from 750 there is a way to do this, and I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Nan? Good evening. I'm Dane City Commissioner Nan Whaley. It's my pleasure to be here, and it's been an honor to serve you as uh, your city commissioner for the past eight years. I decided to run for mayor because I thought we needed someone who was full-time and really focused around creating jobs, working on our neighborhoods, and being an open and vibrant community. Uh, since we have a question along with the introduction, I'll just go right to the question as well. I think there's lots of work that can be done to work to make sure that we have positive behavior in schools and it can be affirmative instead of disciplinary in action. Uh, the Eddings Foundation, for example, asked me to be on a committee to really follow best practices that have worked across the country to deal with uh, making sure that we have positive reinforcements in our, in our schools. So uh, an example is, is when a child uh, does well, they get a reward for uh, following the rules in the school instead of it being based on disciplinary action. Uh, we've worked at this in many schools uh, and it has done, it has done a, a pretty good job of really changing the culture in schools and making this culture be more open and welcoming to those students. So I think that is a great first step in that effort. Uh, I'm sure we'll have more questions about the school to prison pipeline um, and I'm glad to be here today. Joey Williams is next. 
good afternoon or evening now, I guess. It's a little after six. My name is Joey Williams, and I want to uh, thank you all for having this forum. I've been looking forward to this one. This really falls right in line with the issues that are most important to me as I run for re-election this year. Um, you mostly probably have my, my information, uh, my literature piece, and you can see my entire blueprint. What I really want you to, to pay attention to is what we want to do around safety. And that's where I've been spending most of my attention um, over the past three or four years, is what can we do to reduce crime in our community? What can we do to have our police and our community work closer together? So those are things I've been spending time on. As it relates directly to the school to prison pipeline, I think that's a very serious subject that we have to take, pay very close attention to. And I do agree that some of the zero tolerance policies that we see throughout the country, not just in Dayton, but throughout the country as it relates to our young people contribute to that, and that continues on up. We have zero tolerance policies as it relates to our police departments. So I think it's very important that we understand that people have to be looked at on an individual basis, and we need more community-oriented policing. We need more community-oriented folks within um, the schools. So uh, those are things that I'm going to work hard on. I do think we can make a difference here. Um, the last thing that we need to do is just say that one size fits all uh, within the city or one size fits all uh, within the schools. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David is Roddy. Two minutes is not long enough to discuss this, but I'm going to tell you as many quick stories as I can. First off, for the last 26 years, I've been a big brother to an African-American male. He's done two tours of three years each in separate correctional facilities. Very different experience in one than the other. The second one, he got a, a full year under his belt of a two-year associate degree with a 3.99 grade point. He did great. He comes back here, he goes to Sinclair, and the very first day he runs into one of the Sinclair community, uh, community college police officers. They run his name, and they find out that he's got a warrant. From, four, after, from before, he went in for three years, and they take him in and lock him up on his first day back to school. There is no excuse for that. If, we don't clear the warrant when he goes to the prison. We got a problem, and it, it bothers me greatly that this is the kind of response a felon gets. Secondly, I'm going to bring up a story about my then 12-year-old who took some candy to school that she found that was adult-oriented. I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. She, it was found in school, and she got a 10-day suspension. Her friend, whose mother was a teacher at the school, got a five-day suspension. This is the zero tolerance rule. Now here are two little girls getting sent home from school for 10 days because they took some candy to school that was shaped like a male organ. That's unacceptable. I know, because of my experience in, in working with <coughs> Superintendent Ward and Mr. Lawrence, that that wouldn't happen today. The schools are working hard to stop that zero tolerance nonsense. So that's two stories. But third, and a lot last, kids who don't have things to do, don't have parks to go to, playgrounds to play in, they get in trouble. They don't have coaches, they don't have activities. That's why I put up over 240 basketball nets in this community, and I continue to do it, and it's a disgrace what we've let our parks and recreation programs fall into, and we've got to fix that. I've got more stories to tell, but we're going to have to get to that later because my time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Je um, Jeffrey Mams. Okay, thank you. Thank all of you for being here. Uh, I got too many stories for two minutes. I got too many stories for two hours uh, or, or two days even. But the issue that I think we have to address is what causes them to fall into the situation in the first place. You know, oftentimes you hear individuals talking about pulling children out of the stream, but no one goes upstream to find out why they're falling in. The issue has to be more preventive in terms of things that you do and things that you work at. I have uh, probably 40 years of experience in terms of working with young people in countless programs, um, First Tee, Dayton Youth Golf Academy, uh, Mentors Matters with the Y, uh, Botillion, uh, Kappa League. I mean, I can go on and on with the type of things that I've done in my career because I see prevention as the major issue as, as opposed to just waiting until something happens. Now, we have some things that have to be changed. Uh, one of the big issues that our children have, even as some of our adults have, if you don't have a vision of hope, like some people say a lot of times, if you don't, don't know where you are, then you don't know where you're going. Don't know where you've been, you certainly don't know where you're going. 
our children, unfortunately, because of some things that are happening through the educational process, through no fault of this district or any district, that mandates certain types of curriculum that strips our, our staff and our parents of the, the, the uh, opportunity to teach them about their history. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a positive self-concept, mm -hmm. it's hard to get you to understand in terms of where you're going and that vision. When I talked with the police chief uh, at one of the violence prevention programs that the city sponsored this past, uh, this past summer, one of the things that he said about the weapons, I'm going to be real quick with this, that we, there are more weapons in Centerville and suburban areas and rural areas than there are in Dayton. The problem is that the Dayton citizens do not have the tools <coughs> to handle their conflict without anger, violence, and rage. I'm going to stop there because there's a whole lot more to this issue than what we can do in a couple of minutes. Thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is David K. Greer, and I'm running for a city commission. Uh, I'm a candidate for the city commission. I have been working for the last 15 years trying to utilize the system that allows citizens to be involved in the decisions of the city government. However, I have uh, deducted that it doesn't work. Uh, the, the system is it, the way it was designed, if it worked the way it was designed, it would be an excellent system, but it does not work the way it was designed. And that is synonymous with, uh, if, you, if you look at history, uh, back to even before we were allowed to get an education, well, uh, it is it's tainted with uh, curriculums that uh, are inaccurate. It is tainted with uh, uh, the fact that there's double standards in the society. Uh, so there's a lot of things that uh, were uh, enacted into law but it did not apply to a class of people. We, we grew up believing in these, these curriculums because we had the opportunity to get an education, not understanding that there was tools of brainwashing uh, embedded in those curriculums. So as, as, as we uh, went forward, that coupled with uh, the lack of jobs, that coupled with so many other elements that uh, society, through the, the process of implementation and doing for uh, the haves and the have-nots, it has created a quiet bar for uh, a, a lot of people, especially the, the people that are low to moderate income. So I plan on, as a city commissioner, exposing those inadequacies, making it visible, and holding people accountable. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Zero tolerance policies. Uh, several of the candidates mentioned zero tolerance policies, and they are a big issue. <laughs> Ohio is one of the states that actually has a law that requires a certain level of zero tolerance. Uh, they, they're the first step in a child's journey through the pipeline. Uh, they often impose severe discipline on students uh, without regard to the circumstances. Uh, in 2012, there was over 5,000 out-of-school suspensions for black students in Dayton, and 69% of those were for disobedient or disruptive behavior. Uh, um, there's no evidence that zero tolerance policy makes schools safer or improves student behavior, and most of the <laughs> research suggests that they're overused. There is a Bennett Senate bill going through now, Senate Bill 167, which would undo the zero tolerance law in Ohio. Um, the question is, would you support eliminating, uh, support Senate Bill 167 and advocate for its um, passage? And even if the bill doesn't pass, would you support a local moratorium on out of school suspension for disruptive and disobedient behavior. Um, Mr. Williams, um, and, and, and instead, excuse me, and sorry, and and instead substitute a restorative justice or positive change approach. Those are approaches that focus on the individual and and the situation and what is needed to restore relationships. Mr. Williams. 
Yeah. As I stated in my opening, um, I'm not a fan at all of zero tolerance policies. I think that that's something that we should be looking at, not only in the <coughs> schools, but as a city. We have to find ways to look more at individuals, find ways to um, meet individual needs. You know, when you look at schools directly, um, I can use my own personal son as an example. Um, little things like if his cell phone pops out of his pocket, they, they want to suspend him for stuff like that. And what if there's an issue going on where there's a family member who's having a, um, uh, is hospitalized, or there's a, you know, there's a very particular issue, and those things happen, next thing you know, my son is suspended from school. Those type of things are going on right now. And so I do think that we need to, again, move away from the zero tolerance policies. Now, I don't want to mistake that for we don't want to have discipline. I don't want to mistake that for we want to allow um, chaos in schools or in the streets. There has to be a balance. But just outright zero tolerance policies, um, I'm not a fan of it, and I would do things to try to end that, and I already work on things to try to end that. Thank you. Yeah. One of the uh, programs I was involved in in uh, 1988 and um, beyond was the New Futures Initiative, uh, which was a $20 million grant that we worked on with this community to identify as many of the non-school problems that children had, uh, primarily middle school, and then address those problems so that when they came to school, they would be able to concentrate more on the academic process. And as a director of that program, primarily working with Roth, Roth Wilbright, and Kaiser, I instituted a program, program called, uh, uh, called Evening Institute. So when children were doing things that they shouldn't be doing in school, I gave their parents an option, as opposed to them being suspended for three days or staying after school for three days, three hours. And those three hours, they got three things. First thing they got was remediation in terms of their schoolwork. The second thing they got was conflict mediation training from the police department on a voluntary basis. And the of course, and we fed them. And the other thing that they got called community service, where they had to walk around with the custodian and clean up inside and outside of the building. Now, 99% of the parents opted for that option. Because when you suspend the child and they get behind in school, then when they come back, they're still behind. Now, to answer to your question, there are a lot of options out there. Those options cost money. And as we have gone through the process right now where we are, what, in the fourth decision some 17 years ago from the Supreme Court that said we shouldn't fund schools the way that we do, schools have had to readjust their budgets to address issues dealing with testing. That bill should be uh, supported, and if not supported, we should work on the kind of things in this community that will benefit our community. The schools go along with the city. There's no great school system in a poor community. There's no great city that has poor schools. So if you think there's one going to happen without the other, it ain't happening. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Mr. Greer? The mindsets of the so-called powers that be, the decision makers, uh, the policy makers, they have to be changed because their mindsets are set to where those same principles and practices of double standards. You take a, a, an initiative such as zero tolerance and it's turned around and used against people. You know, it's, it's, it's a facade for those that are, are chose to be uh, left behind. Mm. You know, uh, the mere fact that there was a law uh, called leave no child behind, you know, uh, it, it was really uh, a slap in the face because they have a design to leave children behind based on the, the demographics in the areas they live in, you know, the, the type of uh, economics that are in certain uh, communities. You know, it's the, the mindset still goes back and it's tied into uh, 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 institutionalization and systemic racism. See, uh, those components are the cancers of our society. And that's why I speak of visibility, exposure, and accountability. We have to expose those things, have a dialogue about it, so that we can address it, as opposed to just 
pushing it under the rug and act like it doesn't exist. Communication is key. Holding people accountable to what they're responsible for is another significant ingredient. And we have to commit to working together to implement these changes. Because until we do that, we will continue at the same pace and place we are. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Wagner. You know, I'm not going to get my whole story out about uh, what happened at Allen Classical Academy. So there's a, a young lady back here, Anne Marie. I wrote about it in this week's uh, city paper. You'll, you'll, you can pick a copy up and you'll get, to, you'll get a chance to read the whole story. One of the parts of that story, though, is that not just that the suspensions were dropped and, and, and suspensions were reduced, but the big changes that happened in the school. When you're not suspending kids, kids stay in school and they learn. When they stay in school and they learn, they do better. Allen Classical Academy, over that five-year period, went from a a testing on national tests in the 36th percentile to the end of the five years testing in the 62nd percentile. Now, I fully support Senator Charlita Traveris's uh, House, um, Senate Bill 167 because she has shown not only what uh, is happening with her kids, but she's shown that it just is not necessary to have zero tolerance policies. About 6% of our suspensions in Ohio are done on kids that have uh, reacted violently or brought drugs into school. About 80% of kids who are being suspended are being suspended because of back talk, disrespect, or minor infractions that have to be dealt with but do not require a suspension. And unless we deal with those kinds of minor infractions in a more <coughs> productive way, we are not going to be able to find ourselves keeping kids in school. If we don't keep kids in school, kids do fall behind. And if they fall behind once, one suspension, if they fall behind, they will pay the devil to catch up for the rest of that year mm -hmm. and probably for the rest of their lives. That's why we have to change the systems. Thank you. Mr. Estrada. Realistically, the City Commission is not going to be able to tell Superintendent Ward, Mr. Lawrence, what to do about this. This is their ballywick, this is the school board's ballywick. But what we have to do is work together to turn this into a true learning community and make sure that every Dayton Public School student, every young citizen in this city, has the power and the tools to lift themselves out of poverty and the ability to grow and develop the skills that are going to need for this century, not last century. To that effect, I think it's time that we do some things that are innovative that are going to bring people back into this community and make them want to live here. Instead of spending money on speculative real estate or blowing up buildings downtown, we could invest in our students and get every one of them a digital device. We could build a Wi-Fi system throughout our entire city. They did it in Estonia in 2002. That's how far behind we are. You just read that LA Public Schools bought everybody iPads and they're all worried about what the kids see online. I'm worried about what the kids don't see when they can't get online. I want to make sure every student has an opportunity to get online and teach themselves if they can't be taught in the schools. And to give you two examples of that, one, MIT just admitted a 16-year-old from Mongolia. How'd they find him? He maxed a class online that he took on circuit design. Not very many people got 100% on it. 16-year-old kid from Mongolia has a better chance of getting an MIT and better internet access than kids in West Dayton. That's wrong. I think we can fix that. So let's look at things that we can do to make massive change. And one of the other things I've, I've been working on with Superintendent Ward and a few other people is actually looking at a residential school, a boarding school type environment, because some kids need to be out of the households they're in and be in an immersive environment. And that option is not available here in Dayton, and I've got people working together and qu connecting them to make that happen. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Stoddy, I'm sorry. I didn't quite quest cast your answer. Will you support oh, Senate, Bill right, Senate Bill 167? Absolutely. Thank you. Not that we have anything to do with it. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, 
As I mentioned in my opening, I was on the uh, board to look into the Eddings Foundation with Positive Behavior, PBC, uh, that was mentioned in the question. And we found uh, it was data driven through five schools in the city of Dayton, and we found that uh, when those efforts happened, that more kids were in school, they learned uh, better, uh, they uh, uh, had less school suspensions, and the culture of the school was all around improved. Now, to Dayton Public Schools' credit, my understanding is that they took this testing, it was data-driven, and did this across all of the schools in the, in the city of Dayton, and so they should get a lot of credit for that. It was an honor to serve on that and to learn a lot about what positive uh, behavior change can do in schools. It's a good best practice. So, um, you know, I would be supportive of Senate Bill 167 and uh, appreciate the question. Thank you. Um, next comment is schools today rely on law enforcement rather than teachers and administrators to handle minor uh, school misconduct. Growing numbers of school districts employ full time police officers or school resource officers to patrol uh, elementary, middle, and high school hallways with little or no training in working with youth. These officers approach youth as they are adult perps on the street rather than children at school. The explosion of school-based arrests cannot be attributed to an increase in youth violence. The question is, what role should the city of Dayton police officers play in the safety and security? What would you would you support a Dayton police policy of limiting the arrest of kids at school to violent behavior only? Uh, Nan Whaley. Uh, you know, we have talked more about it with uh, Dayton Public Schools about how we can be more collaborative with uh, Dayton police officers in the, in the schools for people to see positive role models in the schools for us to, to really work to make sure that we can have some of our young kids think about being police and firefighters. And so that's the conversation that we're having, not about uh, zero tolerance, but how can we really have some folks in there so that, that they can see and model that, that, that behavior for them to take the test and be thinking about being a police and a firefighter. So that's, that's where we're really more focused on. Uh, that's the position that we've had conversations with Dayton Public. Obviously when Dayton Public has an issue and they need police, we're obviously there to, to answer that, but it's, it's really in the school's hands on, on what they need from the city of Dayton. So is that no, you don't? The, well, the I mean, I think, we'd ha I think we would have to work with Dayton, poli Dayton Police and the Dayton Public Schools. I don't feel comfortable with us saying this is our policy without having the conversation with Dayton Public Schools. Thank you. David is writing. Let's see. We don't have enough police on the streets, so somehow we're going to have police in the schools. I don't think that's going to happen. I think you just need to go down in front of our brand new school building which we all call E.J. Brown, but they now like to call it Edwin Joel Brown, where we have a brand new basketball court. But we took the rims down. Took the rims down from a brand new basketball court because supposedly we had too many problems with fights and gangs and this, that, and the other thing. That's not the school's problem. That's where we need police, where we can work with the kids, police athletic leagues. We need to have coaches, parks and rec supervisors, we need to have people out working with our children. That ain't happening. And when kids are left on their own with no structure, no programs, and no basketball nets or no, no rims, that's what you have. You start having problems. We've got our focus entirely wrong in this city. We're busy worrying too much about vacant buildings and buying new buildings and building buildings for companies that haven't come and giving tax abatements to other buildings that we forgot about providing for our kids. When I go up to Hickory Dale Park at the end of Hillcrest, and I gotta go wind back on a road where back behind a stand of trees where no one can see what's going on back there to find a basketball court, that's pretty sad. And when we can have the, the chain link fence stolen off the tennis courts with nobody catching it, that's even worse. Because we don't care about providing for our kids and giving them opportunities. We need to change that. We need to have work it so that the kids feel comfortable with our police officers and that there's interaction, that they're not so busy running from crime to crime and they can spend the time with the kids. So, you know, let's talk about what we really need to fix in our community first. Instead of talking about parentheticals, because that's what we're talking about right here. All right? We need more police officers on our streets. 
we need them doing the right things, and we need our hoops up. Thank you. I would like to point out that we already have 31 police officers in Dayton schools, licensed police officers with the power to arrest and the power to uh, uh, that work within the school. So um, that's a I, misappropriation of funds. Is okay, what it is. I, I just want to point out that it's not a hypothetical. Okay, are you going to correct ahead. me at every chance you get, Please, Ms. Ahead, Randall? Mr. Yes, if okay, your facts you. are incorrect. Well, Go if you'd given me that fact beforehand, Ms. Randall, we wouldn't have that problem, would okay, you? Okay, thank you. Go ahead, they're, they're, not, they're not police officers. In the building. Okay, thank you. They're not police officers. The, the mere thought of these officers, some that have been retired police officers, creates the, the, the fear factor that exists in our society and has existed for a long time based on those bad apples uh, uh, law officers that existed over, over time. And so that, uh, that has not gone away. Uh, we do not consider the moral ethics associated with uh, cultures. And what I mean by that is that exists so to have a uh, conglomeration of retired police officers who are arresting kids for uh, a minor things, we don't even consider the fact that until a child was 18, they were treated as a juvenile. We, we've gotten away from that. The, the mindset is that they're, they're all criminals based on how we've been inundated and force-fed through our media mm. of, about our children. We have more children that's doing what's right than those that are not. But we don't hear about that. So we, it, it's a misnomer associated with whether or not a child, regardless of what the infraction was, should be arrested or some other minimal uh, disciplinary action taken uh, by our system, <coughs> inclusive of those uh, security officers that are in the schools, understanding that because of things that have happened in the schools, we've got to have a, a certain level of security. I mean, uh, that's a given. We have to do that. But we need to look at how many ex-police officers we do put in our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I need to really make a clarification. As an organization, we met with Dayton Public Schools, uh, uh, two new heads of safety and security, both of whom are retired police officers. One is Jamie Bullins, a retired police officer from Dayton. His assistant is a retired police officer from Trotwood. And of, of that meeting, they admitted that all of the school resource officers are actually trained as police officers by the state of Ohio Attorney General's Office. So you have a different leveling of police officers. While they don't carry guns, they are technically police officers, and that's exactly what we were saying. There are 31 of them in Dayton Public Schools. A.J. Wagner. The superintendent shaking her head now. Okay, Mr. Wagner. Okay. Mr. Wagner, please. Okay. Thank you. Did you uh, miss me more? Did you get a chance to get a chance? We haven't finished. We're we, we, mixing them up. We're mixing them up. Yeah, we got you. We'll get back. <laughs> I, am, uh, uh, I, am, I am confident that properly trained police officers, security officers, uh, school officers can handle. Uh, school situations without arresting and without um, um, uh, sending every kid off to jail who has an infraction. I say that because I think that, that, that a well-trained officer understands these things and can do those things. Now, what you have to watch for is that, that officer who, well, it's the same, uh, every, to a hammer, everything's a nail. And, and, and you, right. don't, you don't want, of course, officers going off every time a kid smart mouths them and, and saying the solution to this is to put you in cuffs and take you downtown. But with proper training, with tro proper uh, restraint and exercise and care and understanding, uh, that's not going to happen. 
Um, I, I would hope that the officers are not just a POTA certified, Ohio Police Officer Training Academy certified, but that the officers who get into the schools are also trained otherwise with child psychology and other courses that make them help them understand uh, what kids need and what kids want. I, I happen to have a brother-in-law who uh, took over as a principal for a uh, high school that where suspended kids went to, and this was in the city of Pittsburgh, inner city of Pittsburgh. And, and when he took over, he told stories about how uh, the school just punished everything and everybody. That if you were in trouble, they didn't give you your food. You were, if you got in trouble, you smart mouthed or you, 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 you caused some kind of look in, at somebody strange, you would get arrested. And what he found out was that he could work much better with the students. He actually took the police officers and told them to stand outside the door. Don't come into school. And he found much better results with the kids once he took away that intimidation. I don't know if that's a solution or not, but it's a bother. Thank you. Mr. Mim, you're next. I so apologize. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so anxious to answer that question. <laughs> I didn't want to be left out. Um, you know, um, prior to my being on the uh, on the Dayton School Board, uh, the district had cut out music, art, PE at the elementary level, and all the high school sports with the exception of football, basketball, and track. And um, after being on the board, and then after becoming board president, uh, hired uh, a couple superintendents. Ms. Ward was one of those. We looked at some data that clearly indicated that during the time that we had eliminated those activities for children, we had a 20% increase in suspensions for negative behavior, both at the high school and the elementary school. Now, the rationale that was given to the board at the time was that we need to save $180,000. When we also lost an additional 200 children at high school level, because they transferred out to other schools at $7,000 each, we basically lost $1.4 million mm. in an effort to save uh, $180,000. Mm. Oftentimes, the pressures on leaders force them to do some things that they don't intend with the, comp the uh, consequences uh, to happen as they do. When we look at across this nation that three years ago, Ohio's graduation rate uh, or let me rephrase that, the dropout rate for African American males was 40%, 40, we ranked 49th, let me rephrase that. We ranked 49th in the nation for African American male dropout rate just three years ago. Now, that's not a Dayton problem by itself, that's a state problem, and many of the issues that we deal with are at the state level and some at the federal level. If you don't have the, the clout, the expertise, and the issue in terms of understanding where those problems are coming from, and understand that it is by design that they're not fixing school funding. There's no mystery that suburban schools do better, rural schools do better than that, and then urban schools do worse because of the economic issues that are associated with us. If we as a community can't get our children ready for kindergarten, then we're behind by four years before they even start. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Williams. All right, thank you. Um, let me just state, I, I was not part of the school board that Mr. Mill was talking about took that money out. <laughs> that was not me, okay? Um, hopefully I can remember the question, because it was a good question, and the answers have been everywhere, so I, I don't know. Do you want me to repeat it? Um, I think I'm pretty good on it. I think I'm pretty good. I think the question was, would we like to see um, Dayton police officers in the schools? Um, and I think uh, there's been some confusion on the question, but I would just say, in terms of current Certified Dayton police officers. That would not be my desire to see them in the schools right Thank now. Thank you. That, that would be. That's Thank what I would you. say. Um, I would like to see them in the schools, though, to try to help build relations with our young people. And I think I don't know how many of you guys are aware of this. I mean, I really believe we are at the beginnings of a real movement in the city of Dayton. And Reverend McCory is a part of that, and some others. But we are trying to break down some of the barriers that exist between how our young people feel about the police and, quite frankly, how the police about some of our young people and there's a lot of work going on with that from block parties <coughs> to just talking one-on-one -on -one, trying to get them into schools trying to encourage them to want to be police officers themselves and it's a tough job I mean we really have a lot of work to do here so do I want to see police officers arresting young people absolutely not do I want to see young people in our schools trying to encourage them and build that relationship up 
Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Black students are disproportionately represented at every stage of the school to prison pipeline. Uh, African American students are form, far more likely than their white peers to be suspended, expelled, or arrested for the same kind of conduct at school. In 2012, African American youth made up 64, approximately 64 percent of the Dayton public school population, but accounted for about 80 percent of the out of school suspensions. Uh, the disciplinary actions, there are per hundred students in, were 60.9 per 100 students for black students and 28.6 per 100 students for white students. These statistics indicate a substantial racial disparity in disciplinary action in Dayton Public Schools, particularly regarding black students. What is your explanation for these statistics and what do you believe the solution is to remedying this issue and what role can the city play? We know that a lot of the, that the school board, that the remedying these issues is housed in the school board, but the question becomes what role can the city play in uh, remedying it? AJ? Mr. Wagner. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. If I'm uh, fortunate enough to become mayor of the city, uh, I want to work very closely with Superintendent Ward and with the schools. And, and if they ask for my help, I want to be able to help and assist them in any way possible. I uh, uh, don't, frankly, don't know how, as a mayor, um, I would be able to uh, interfere in the school's operation to that level, to that, to that detail, to that, in that way. Uh, certainly, uh, as complaints come in or people tell me about problems, I would relate those to the superintendent. I would relate those to, to the folks at the Dayton City Schools. But in terms of actually um, having a program other than the one I mentioned and that you can read about in the Dayton City paper right here. Um, other than that, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't want to uh, interfere with uh, the operation of the schools. I don't want to run the schools. I want to run the city, and I want to solve the city's problems. Um, I would hope that Superintendent Ward will tell me if there are any problems and issues I can help, but but she she doesn't probably want to run the city either, so I would probably stay away from that. Mr. Mr. Mims, thank you. Uh, that data is extremely alarming, and it again, unfortunately, it hasn't gotten better. Uh, and like I said earlier, for those who are making some of the laws, there's no intent for it to get better. Uh, when we look at how we have redefined education to be test scores and at the same time reduced the amount of resources that school districts and communities have to make things happen for their people, then they have a, a hard issue in which they have to have to balance. Uh, the teacher's evaluations are on test scores, the principal evaluation on test scores. And it's it's challenging because of the fact that a lot of the kinds of things that build the kind of character, hope, dreams, and visions that children need to have to <clears> move <throat> through the process have been eliminated. We cannot mandate achievement. And when children don't see any way of getting ahead by doing something right, then unfortunately they fall into that trap of doing something wrong, and therefore that data that you talked about begins to accumulate. Both of my children graduated from DPS. And both of my children are very successful because of the quality education they got in raising this community, in this community. And both have more degrees than I have, and they both make more money than I do, which I think is good, okay? They don't have to ask me for money. But <laughs> the, the, the issue that I see after being in, in, in Dayton all these years, we don't have what our children need now that we had for our children 10, 15, and 20 years ago. A lot of the adults are afraid to address children and correct their behavior, even sometimes when it's minor behavior, because they're not sure how they're gonna respond. And then if you don't correct minor behavior, then that behavior gets to be major behavior. We don't trust each other the way we used to trust each other. You know, I have to tell you that, you see that and you know that every day. The issue in terms of those who have the responsibility for overseeing 
our community and our children have a multitude of challenges. And I say in closing. Thank, thank, thanks, Dale. Okay. We'll, we'll get back treat to our kids you. the way you want someone to treat yours. <laughs> okay. That's right. Mr. Williams. <laughs> All right. Um, in terms of those statistics, they are alarming. And, you know, they're not only at the school level, they're in society. If you go back to the 80s, I believe, um, I saw a statistic, one in 53 Americans were in the jail of entry to penal system. In the um, early 2000s, it was one in 32. Um, I don't have the most current one, but I do hear the most current for African-American males. One in three have been in prison or been some part of the prison system. One in three. And so it's not just a school issue, it's a, it's a mindset that we have, and it gets back to the zero, zero tolerance issue. So I think if there's anything that we can do differently is we do need to move away from this zero tolerance mentality that's throwing people, either suspending folks while they're, suspending our young people while they're in school, or putting our young adults in jail. Um, we have to get away from that. And so to me, it's all a part of us getting back involved and not trying to treat people like numbers. You know, data and technology is good on one hand, but the bad part is it allows people with decisions to sit back in a tower or a room, and they don't get out and interact with people enough, and they just look at numbers and reports. We have to get back involved with people, you know. So one of the things, just on a personal level, um, I enjoy being a city commissioner, and certainly we have to make decisions based on policy and reports and numbers, but I really enjoy, my, my, my most fun is getting into the community, being a part of the community. I still try to make time to coach young people, still find time to go to and give money and help people when they have to go to the debutantes and bow tickets, and it gets expensive, by the way. But, 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 but it's, uh, it's necessary. We have to be a part of that. We can't hide. We have to help our young people, and they have to see us, and we have to be visible, and we can't treat everybody like a report and never get out and be a part of the community. So I think that's part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Esrati. Uh, let's see. When I went to jail, I was smiling when they took my mug shot. That doesn't happen for most people. I knew why I went there. I was standing up for my rights, standing up for your rights, your right to speak at the city commission meeting. And I learned a lot through that experience. I learned that we do not have a justice system. We have a legal system. And that legal system is messed up. You know, a big part of the reason it's messed up is money and politics. I'm sorry, when it takes $260,000 to get 5,000 votes in a primary for, to run for the mayor, and the job only pays $45,000 a year, something's wrong, and we have to put an end to it. So here I am with my $10,000 campaign. I can't get bought out. I can't get sold. I've raised almost $9,000. I'm just like this close to $9,000. I'm going to hit my $10,000 goal. And I've also had people donate basketball nets and basketball rims, of which three I've put up at Princeton. But, you know, we got problems in this country, and they are not going to get changed by talking about these statistics until we get to the real statistics that are at the base root of the problem. base root of the problem is Congress is bought and sold. Our governorship is bought and sold. Our mayoral candidates are, are, are running on uh, money from outside the community, and they're focused on doing things that are not in the best interests of our community. We got to change that. We got so many people in prison because we don't stand up for our rights. And our rights should be equal access to things like the internet, to schools, to books, to have a neighborhood that's safe and secure, and that has not been the emphasis that's been around here. And we're going to go around and change that. And we're going to start out with a $10,000 campaign for city commission. Thank you. Mr. Chair. I feel the percentiles associated with statistics are just as suspect as, as those other things uh, that we are force-fed, like polls. You, you hear the results of polls all the time. But I don't get called. They don't ask me, you know. So who, who are they calling for these polls? You know? So, you, you know, so uh, that's the same principle that's associated with the double standards that uh, exist in our society. You know, uh, with our kids, how are you going to let uh, a one group of people come up with this uh, this equation 
that gives you some statistics uh, that they have to meet in order for funding to go that way or in order for them to uh, obtain a certain grade level, you know. It, it comes out of the air. It's no different, to me, it's no different than the betting line that is published in the newspaper every day. You know, it's, it's like it's a game. You know, I, I, I don't get it. You know, how can you tell me that just because this company came up with these statistics based on benchmarks and, and other equations that goes into it to say that these individual children fall beneath where they need to be as far as being educated. Not only is it unfair to our children, it's unfair to our educators who, because they love to teach, is why they're in it. But their hands are tied because there's so many different directives and parameters that does not allow them to teach the children like they want to with the love they want to teach them with. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Whaley. Uh, I think that the, uh, Commissioner Williams probably had the best answer to this, that the mayor and the commission can lead by uh, uh, really changing the culture of zero tolerance and how we treat each other in the community. Uh, one of those examples we just saw this year was the Stand Your Ground Law and how it is uh, put, it is uh, disproportionately affects African Americans, can, you know, uh, than than whites, and that's a good example of how a law that's deemed fair isn't really applied fairly across the board. And to that end, the commission stood up and said, "We're against House Bill 203. We were the first commission in the state of Ohio, the first uh, local government, to send a resolution up. I heard Toledo just passed one this past week to stand up and say this kind of action isn't right, and we want laws that will be." Um, not written to look fair, but are actually fair. And I think that that's really what's key, and that's what the commission and the mayor can really do, is they can provide that kind of leadership and those kind of conversations in the community to make sure that we are actually doing what we're, we want to happen in our community and our community to, to look that way. So I think Commissioner Williams had the best answer on this, is that's how the city commission and the mayor can really work to make a difference in this effort. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one final comment is that there is no evidence that blacks actually misbehave to a greater degree than white students. They are, however, punished more severely, often for behaviors that are less serious. Uh, minority students with disabilities are particularly vulnerable since many schools regard jail as the default special education placement for poor and minority children. African American students with disabilities are three times more likely to receive short-term uh, suspensions than their white counterparts and uh, more than four times likely to end up in correctional facilities. Well, we're getting to the closing comments part of this section and before we go into that I want to we, we purposely planned it from like 6 to 7 30 to leave time so that you can meet individually one-on-one -on -one, and to meet the candidates and ask them any kind of questions you want specifically. We have refreshments if you like cookies uh, <laughs> uh, that we will put out. So once we finish the closing comments, uh, we'll break and then uh, the candidates will be around for you to be able to talk to and answer questions. We. Uh, uh, before we do that, I want to uh, thank all the many organizations that help us put this together. Um, we have the Adams Project, which has been uh, uh, at the forefront of the mass incarceration for a very long time, the Black Men's Think Tank. Uh, I want to thank the students from my Race and Racism and the law class that I'm teaching this semester who helped uh, with the questions and <laughs> You're going to get your credit, huh? <laughs> um, I, want to, uh, I want to thank the Wesley Center, and, but I especially want to thank the, the Nation of Islam. Uh, we started meeting two months ago, <laughs> and the Nation, at every meeting, the Nation, while people came in and out, the Nation of Islam was there every meeting every was represented meeting. to help yes. us and so I really I really want to thank them for that. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for putting on this forum. It's really important. We all need to spend more time 
working on this very, very important issue. Um, if I'm reelected, and I hope I am, um, you can, I guarantee you I will continue to work on this. This is something that's a really big passion of mine, and um, I really enjoy working with the folks in the community. Um, I often say that you know one of the greatest economic development tools we can have, one of the greatest things that we can do to improve schools, one of the greatest things we can do to make Dayton a better place to live is to improve, is improve uh, and make Dayton a safer place and make, improve it from a crime perspective. And when I talk about crime, I don't talk about it from that zero tolerance perspective. I'm not talking about it from a police state at all. I'm talking about it from a let's join together with police, other jurisdictions, um, community groups like the Adam Project, groups like SERVE, group that we've started like CPC, all churches, individuals. This has to be a community-wide effort. And I think that from the city commission seat, that's something that we have some control over. Um, I feel for the schools right now. I feel for some of the mandates they have to deal with. You know, I don't know if you guys know about the third grade guarantee. And if, if young people don't pass a third grade test, they can be held back. That's putting a lot of pressure, not just on the young people, but our teachers, our administrators, our superintendent. It's tough. But I do think from the city commission chair, what we can do is do everything we can to make sure our city is as safe as possible in the right and fair way. Again, not as a police state, not as a zero tolerance area, but it's an area where we all work together and work with individuals, community groups, churches, not just the city of Dayton, but Trotwood, Sheriff's Department, all of us, as we've been doing, and we're seeing some results. And if I'm reelected, I, I promise you're going to keep working on those results. So please remember me, Joey Williams, for reelection. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Estrada. Let's see. There's three words I think that are real important. Pride, respect, and dignity. And by the way, if it sounds like I'm yelling, this is the command voice I learned in the Army to use when I'm speaking to large groups. I want to make sure everybody can hear me. So I'm not yelling at you. I'm not angry. I'm just making sure my voice carries. But pride, respect, and dignity. And I don't think those have been shown in our community to the people that live here. I don't think it's respectful when you have to wait for a police officer because we spent money blowing up a building downtown and we didn't have money for the police officer, or at least we said we did. Or we bought, spent four or five million dollars collecting real estate for Kroger without a contract. <coughs> or when you've got a guy like James Kent who lives in my neighborhood, who has a business in my neighborhood where he hires ex-cons and trains them to deconstruct houses, keeping 80% of the material out of the landfill, and he sits there with his hands out saying, give me another contract, and they're hemming and hawing, and in the meantime making change orders for half a million dollars on a $130 con thousand dollar contract, to a company from Bellbrook that's a construction company. Something's wrong there, folks. These people right here that take all the big money from who knows where, landfill operators, demolition contractors, that's who they're working for. It's got to stop. It's time to put a stop to the pay to play and the friends and family plan in the city of Dayton, which has been ruining this community. You know what's happening. You know what's been happening. And it's got to stop. When we took South Park and we stopped worrying about the houses and we started worrying about the people building community and, and, and bringing our people together, our property values went up. People want to move in. They buy the houses that have been destroyed and they fix them up. It is possible to bring our city back. But it's not possible when you've got commissioners that are more worried about raising money for their next campaign than worrying about making sure that you are taken care of and protected. So wake up, people. Thank you very much. David Ezrani. Mr. Mims. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know me and I have a record in this community for addressing the needs of this community, uh, primarily dealing with our young people and then moving forward. I've uh, been involved in a variety of things, as I mentioned before, in bringing a $20 million grant to this community, uh, being the chief lobbyist to bring uh, $628 million to this community to build all new schools, uh, working on the Race to the Top application to assist the cooperation between our teachers association and our school board and superintendent to make good things happen as far as learning for children is concerned. My concern as a commissioner, the same as it's been as a state board member, the same as it's been as a Dayton uh, board president, the same as it was when I was union president, the same as it was when I was a uh, political action uh, advisor in the Howe Education Association, has always been to improve the quality of life for people, especially little people. And those little people now have grown up to be big people. 
Joey Williams, one of my former students, Mr. Bogan over there, and I'm glad that I taught them well because I would not want to wrestle with them now. Okay? <laughs> I would not, okay? But the issue that I raise with you is that there are multiple answers to this very complex set of problems that we're dealing with. And far too often we talk about the symptoms of the problem as opposed to the problem itself. The issue in terms of how we create the conditions in this community that we want our children to grow up and experience, how we create the conditions in this community, say, how, I would, I, how would I want to be treated if a police officer stopped me? Okay? How would I want them to address my child, my friend, my cousin, if they stopped them? So we have to work on creating those kind of conditions. Community policing, having police work in the schools as a collaborative person with young people, not carrying guns, you know, meeting with the, um, uh, uh, DeWine, who is the uh, uh, state prosecutor, um, is not a good thing. Mike DeWine. Mike DeWine. It's not a good thing. Uh, however, he did agree at the state board meeting that we do not need to have weapons being carried by teachers or policemen in schools. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Greer. Thank you very much, you know, for all those who contribute to this forum being put on. Uh, I love you for it. The majority of you out in the audience, uh, I've been working with you for years. Uh, uh, a, a plethora of things, you know, that I've done, being the voice for the people. And because of the fact that uh, we've got so many territorial barriers in our respective organizations. Mm -hmm. It gets in the way of us keeping it real. And that's what we have to do. We have to commit to keeping it real and making the changes that are necessary, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to our kids. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, you have to have organizational structure. You know, but you have to also keep the moral ethics involved in it. You have to stand for what you believe in. Whether you're a uh, city commissioner, mayor, uh, school board, you know, you still have to keep the righteousness of what you believe in in the forefront of the mechanism that you're associated with. So when I'm elected, City Commissioner, I'm going to work hard to make sure that those barriers and that the teamwork and working relationships with all the entities in our city works together without there being uh, any type of controversy, controversy, adversity, or anything with negative connotations because that's the only way we're going to get it done and make a change. David K. Greer, November the 5th, for City Commission. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Greer. <laughs> Ms. Whaley. I just want to thank the organizers for this event and appreciate the chance to have a conversation specifically around schools. I have to be honest, I did learn a lot from your statistics that I didn't know as a city commissioner since, uh, you know, we're, we don't uh, control Dayton public schools, obviously, but I think there is ways that the commission and the mayor uh, can really work to provide leadership and collaboration with the entire community. And as commissioner, I've been proud of the work we have done, uh, creating fair hiring policies for ex-offenders, working to really make sure that we have opportunities for um, jobs for uh, folks that have been on the other side of the pipeline. And we have lots of work to do. And it's not easy work, especially with um, the tough job situation we have in the city. So that's why it's so important that we work to create jobs. Uh, that's why I put together a jobs plan that's on my website at nanwhaley.com that works around our eight assets in the city to really work to leverage jobs. Because when we have jobs, it provides more opportunities for everyone in the, situa in, in, in the city. It helps, it helps kids because their parents ha don't have to worry about getting food on the table. It helps those that, that um, give self-esteem, self and it just makes the community stronger. So that's really something that I would really focus on as mayor. I'm asking for your support on November 5th. You can vote every day from 8 to 4 right now at the Board of Elections at 451 West 3rd Street, right at the county building. Um, so please get your vote done, and uh, thanks for this opportunity to, to come and talk about this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wagner. Thank you. You vote every day, but just do it once, okay? <laughs> um, you know, 
Here's my lived experience as a judge. There is rampant discrimination in our legal system. Mm -hmm. My lived experience was watching young men, in particular, and young women, stand before me and seeing young men and women who were from the city, who were poor. 80% of those that stood before me were poor and very disproportionately African American. <coughs> there are as many drugs in Oakwood and Vandalia in Centerville as there are in Dayton. And I didn't see those folks. We have discrimination in our capital punishment laws. Yes. Huge discrimination and discriminatory effects, just as we're talking about in the school to prison pipeline. We have discrimination in the way we enforce the laws. If we're serious about ending it, we have to overturn some of the laws that already exist. Right. The worst decision ever made by the Supreme Court of the United States, the worst, was called McCluskey, and I don't remember versus who, but it was McCluskey. In that case, and it was a capital punishment case, in that case, the court basically said, we don't care about your statistics. We don't care about whether you see large numbers of African Americans being killed through the death penalty, large numbers of African Americans, four times as many as you'll see whites, proportionately. We don't care about that unless you can prove that in this particular case, these folks were deliberately discriminating. In other words, show us what's in their mind. And you can't do it. Right. The only way you can prove discrimination is by the numbers. And that decision said you, don't, you can't look at the numbers. You have to look at individual people and cases. We have to change our laws. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming out. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.